Alrighty guys, what's up? Day Dad here tonight. And uh, we are going to go for part two of the Supermicro 4028GR-TRT uh, setup series this evening. And just wanted to give a, a couple of brief remarks before we actually go downstairs or I cut to downstairs um, and actually start, start assembling everything. Uh, I just want to say that this I've done the best I can to keep everything chronological um, and put together because I filmed this all in different times and you know sometimes I would you know film some stuff and then there would be an issue that would happen I have to go back and, and backtrack a little bit so I've tried to cut and edit and put everything together so you guys have the most cohesive uh, experience as far as how this server goes together but do bear with me there may be some things that um, you may have some questions, so just leave those in the comments and I'll do my best to uh, address those as soon as possible. So, uh, super excited. Um, in this video, we're gonna go over setting up the um, entire server, everything from basically out of the box with all the parts just set on the floor to fully uh, functioning. Uh, the only thing we're not gonna do in this video is we're not going to uh, cover the external rig. So basically, two of the GPUs and in the, the next part, I'm not 100% sure whether it's gonna work yet or not, but I'm telling you now, it's not. And I'm gonna have to do another video of how to actually make the external rig for the uh, 3090s. So we'll cover everything up to getting the server working and two of the GPUs will be installed, um, but the external rig will be a separate video. So anyway guys, without further ado, uh, I'll see you downstairs and we will get going. All right, guys, so now we're downstairs. Um, I've got everything unboxed and, and laid out. So I just wanna quickly go over uh, the plan. So this is the long-awaited uh, Supermicro 4028 uh, 4U server. So it came in today. Um, you can see it's on hand trucks, it's pretty heavy. And it came in all of this uh, big uh, like freight packaging over here um, on that blue crate. So anyway, um, as far as shipping is concerned, it was quite, it was quite expensive. It was like 350 bucks to actually have it shipped um, uh, via, I guess, freight shipping, but it's in almost perfect condition. It looks brand new. Uh, actually, in fact, I just peeled the plastic off the top before it got here. So overall, I think it was a fantastic deal and I'm excited to uh, start working with it. So, all right, next thing is we have these 22 core um, Intel E5 2699V4 uh, GPUs, or sorry, C CPUs rather. So we're gonna put those in because um, this server came bare with basically nothing. Um, next, I have 24 um, 64 gig um, memory modules. So we'll install those today. Uh, of course, the GPUs. So, you know, I'm not 100% sure this is going to fit, um, but we will take maybe the fan shroud off and see if it'll fit. Or I also have an external rig so we might set it up uh, externally if, um, you know, if need be. So these are the RTX 3090s, by the way, the Zotac. Um, and this is, the, this is the P100. So these are the 16 gigabyte P100s. And these are the 24 gig uh, P40s. So all of these are going to go into um, this server. We've also got the um, NVLink bridge. So that's gonna be for the 24090s. We're gonna install that uh, as well. So all of that stuff, guys, is going to go into the server and hopefully it all works. I've tried to map it out as best I can on paper, but these things are always a lot more uh, nuanced than they originally seem. So anyway, I'm gonna go ahead. Oh, last thing uh, it did, this came with rails. So these are already attached here on the side. Um, but I'm not gonna worry about these right now. We're gonna start by assembling as much as possible while it's out here in the open, easier to work with. Um, and then once we get everything kind of assembled, we'll rack it 
um, and, and put everything inside. So anyway, guys, uh, without further ado, we'll hop into it. I'm gonna get the server opened up and then we'll start most likely by installing uh, the CPUs. So I'll see you guys in the next part. All right, guys, so I've got everything cleared off now. I'm gonna go ahead and open the server up. So you just press down these two tabs here and lift up. And wow. I don't know how well you guys can see, but it's basically brand new inside. Let's go back. Yeah, it's basically brand new. I mean, it's uh sorry i'm trying to adjust the there we go yeah so wow that's crazy such a great price for something that's basically brand new all right anyway guys uh what we're gonna do is we're gonna take um this piece off and then we're gonna take this um i guess divider or shroud or uh i, I i'm assuming this is just to help the airflow and then divide um the airflow to both sections of GPUs. So anyway, there's a screw here on the side. There we go. A little Phillips screw here on the side and then one on this side as well. So we're gonna remove those, take this off, and then we're gonna pop this shroud out. All right. There we go. Take this guy out. And then we'll take this guy out. Beautiful. Remove this guy. All right. And then we can pull this out nice and easy. All right. Beautiful. So here are our um, power connections for each of the GPUs. Looks like these are uh, 12 volt EPS, it looks like. Um, and then under here, these are our heat sinks for the, for the CPU, so we'll have to remove these. Here's our um, uh, 24 slots for uh, the DDR4 RAM. Here are our fans, so that's pretty interesting. Um, yeah, so next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to figure out how to remove these um, heat sinks and then we'll go ahead and install the GPUs because, or sorry, the CPUs because there shouldn't be any installed, uh, if I remember correctly, from the shipping instructions, which is fine because I wanted my, I wanted specific GPUs anyway, or specific CPUs anyway. Um, you can tell where my mind is. Uh, so anyway, we're gonna remove these and then we'll get to the next part. All right, guys. So um, I just read through some documentation and I took one of these out. So I am now confident enough to show you how to take out the second one. So I just wanna have a brief disclaimer. Before you do anything on a, a PC, you should be wearing an anti-static wristband or similar. Um, make sure that the metal part, sorry, the metal part under here is touching your skin. Um, and then clip this guy to any bare metal surface um, that is convenient. So I'm just gonna clip it right there. So next, get a handy dandy screwdriver. And then we're gonna start taking off each of these four bolts. So you're supposed to put them on uh, diagonally. So we're gonna take them off in, in the same way. So we're gonna unscrew this guy. Okay, so that's off. Don't be afraid if it pops a little bit. Um, that's unfortunate. Oh, there we go. Couldn't see. All right, now we're in. So let's we'll unscrew this guy. All 
Okay, and you won't be able to unscrew them all the way. They're just on, they're like spring loaded. Um, so just unscrew them until you kind of get that rocking uh, motion. At least mine are actually weren't even screwed down very well at all. So, okay, I think that should be good. And then you can just come in here and you can lift it right off and then voila. So, and well, we'll go over the reinstallation whenever it's time. So from here, I'm gonna go get the CPUs and then we'll drop both the CPUs in uh, and then we'll reinstall these guys. So I'll be right back. All righty guys, so before we actually pop these guys in, I noticed that some, they're, they're pretty clean actually, but there's a little, um, you know, a little bit of leftover uh, thermal paste. So what we're gonna do, and you can actually tell it's a lot more on that one. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna go ahead and clean these really quick. So I just have some 70% isopropyl alcohol laying around. So we're gonna put some of that on a paper towel. Um, and then we're just gonna wipe down the top of the uh, CPUs and just make sure just a little bit there that they're nice and clean. Oh, you know what? That, is that part of it? Yeah, that looks like that's actually part of the uh, top of the CPU. So don't worry about that then. So this guy looks good to me, nice and clean, beautiful. So we'll go ahead and open up this other guy and clean him off. Yeah, you can tell this guy was a little bit dirtier. So yeah, we'll go ahead and clean this guy off best we can some, some old stuff there okay that looks pretty good um so the next part we'll pop them in uh and then we'll put the thermal paste and the uh heat sinks back on all righty guys so as you can see i've already installed uh the cpu on the left side cpu one so now we're gonna go ahead and install CPU two. So I just wanna show you the, fi the finished product. Here it is all clean and nice. Um, so I did clean both sides. There was some, looks like there was some thermal paste in the bottom as well. So I've, I cleaned that off just very gently with some uh, rubbing alcohol, just like I did on the front side. Um, should be fine. But uh, just make sure you wait about a minute or two, I would say, two minutes to be on the safe side. It's probably overkill, but wait to, for the alcohol to dry before you go ahead and drop it in the um, CPU slot. So what we're gonna do now is we're gonna come over here on the side and we're gonna release this, if I can get it with one hand. Oh, sorry, let's do this one first. So let's release this side first. And now this swings out of the way and we can release this side. Okay, cool. So now what we're gonna wanna do is notice there is a little triangle right here. So the triangle there matches the triangle in the top right corner. So the GP or the CPU needs to uh, like um, dr drop in this way. So we're gonna go ahead and we're gonna take this out or take this up, I should say. And then we're gonna very gently, as flat as we can, we're gonna drop this in with the there we go and i always like to give it a little a little wiggle to make sure it's seated in there properly but if you notice the triangle or i guess the little gold triangle is up in the right top right hand corner so that's how uh it should be so we're gonna go ahead and we're gonna put that back we're gonna bring hold this up 
and then we're gonna slide or push this guy back down. And it is, you do have to be a little bit firm with it. Um, it's a lot more pressure than you would expect. And the same thing here. And then everything's locked back into place. Okay, now the next step is we are going to apply some thermal paste. Uh, so I'm gonna go grab that. And I'll see you in the next step. Alrighty guys, so as you can see, I've already got one heat sink back on and I'm not gonna lie to y'all, it was a huge pain in the ass. So um, now that I've learned how to do that one, I'm gonna try to show you guys how to do this one maybe a little bit more efficiently. Um, so first things first, uh, we're gonna apply some thermal paste and the stuff I'm using is called Arctic MX4 uh, Thermal Compound. So uh, it was highly rated on Amazon. I just picked some up last time uh, I uh, built a PC and I've been using it ever since and it seems to work pretty good. So, uh, you know, if you wanna get this or have another brand that you like, go for it. But anyway, what we're gonna do is we're going to um, just put, uh, there's a lot of different methods. You know, I think sometimes people get a little bit overly, overly complicated, but uh, basically what we're gonna do is we are just going to uh, put a little dot if I can ever get this cap off. I literally just did this. What? There we go. Okay. So now it caps off. And normally what I like to do is just put like a, the size of this capacitor, like one of the like medium sized capacitors, uh, just right in the middle of the uh, CPU. So, you know, if you have another method that you prefer, go, go right ahead. But um, I'm just going to do what I would normally do. So we'll go ahead and put a capacitor size dollop. And that's gonna be just fine. Let's go ahead and get all that right there. Let's go wipe it off. And then we'll put the cap back on gently this time. <laughs> okay, now for the fun part. So next, what we're gonna have to do is put the um, heat sink back on and this is a huge pain because you can be almost perfectly level and and I was trying to be really gentle last time and you need to be balanced between gentle uh, and firm be gentle when you set it on while you're trying to align each of these four screws with um, these posts here so it doesn't look that complicated, but it is more complicated than you would think. And also one thing that helped me is taking the fans out so you can see the screw holes just a little bit better. So I'm gonna do that. And what way you can do that is you can push this little tab and then the fans just slide out. So anyway, let's um, I'm gonna refocus this camera. A little bit better here so we can see okay so like I said I'm gonna try to do this as best I can but uh, it's really kind of a kind of a crapshoot to be honest so set them on as best as you can okay I think I actually got that first try miracle okay it seems like it's seated or like starting to seat so anyway what we're gonna do now all right cool so we're gonna go around each of these in an alternating pattern and we're gonna tighten them. so one two three four or whatever whatever pattern you want but just try to make sure that the screws catch so it's harder than you actually would think to get them to do that, or all of them to do that anyway. So you gotta be a little bit forceful when you press down on these. Ah, uh, damn, this one may not be caught. All right, so now all three of these guys are tight. This one's still loose. The 
Yep. Damn, that one didn't catch. All right. So, I'm gonna loosen this guy back up all the way. Okay, so that's all the way out. And we'll try to get these two to catch now. That one's caught now. So let's go back to this guy. Okay, cool. Both of these are now caught. I hope. Perfect. Okay. So now finally everything is tight. just barely tight okay cool everything's just just tight just so okay so that was reinstalling the heat sinks so sorry that was the pain and took a while but uh, sometimes these kind of things do and there's just not really a better way to do it or at least not one that I know of so, okay, just put the fans back. Um, so the next thing that we're gonna do, guys, is we're gonna just go ahead and install um, all of the RAM, and then we'll go to the GPUs. Alrighty, guys, so now we're gonna start putting in uh, the RAM. Just a couple things to note here. So the RAM I bought comes in basically two module kits. Um, and then there is eight different uh, memory channels. So A all the way through H. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna take one kit and we're gonna go from uh, like split the first kit. So each, each module in the first kit, uh, we're gonna split it between A1, uh, B1, and then go C1, D1, uh, and so on all the way up. And then we'll basically break each kit across uh, the consecutive memory channels um, and the same number. So A1, B1, C1, D1, etc. So that's what we're going to do. Uh, and I'll just go ahead and, and show the first one here, our first couple, and then I'll fast forward through it. Um, oh, you know what? What we're going to do first, though, is we're going to go ahead and take out these fans because that's gonna make our lives a whole lot easier. So we're just gonna set the fans over here. Hurt my fingers. Okay, cool. So, show you guys um, next little piece here. So, uh, I'll try to show you as best I can. Let's zoom in just a bit. All right, so as you guys can hopefully see, there's dim. Uh, A123, B123, C123, D123, and then again, uh, over here, uh, E, F, H, and G. Sorry, this is such bad quality here. Maybe that's a little bit better. Anyway, so that's what we're looking at. So each, this, this block here um, corresponds to these six DIMM slots. So um, this guy would be, I don't know if I could show you. This would be A1, A2, A3, uh, B1, B2, B3, um, and so on. So anyway. With that out of the way, and now we know how we're how we're gonna load. I will set this guy back up. Cool, and then we'll go ahead and start loading all these guys up. So, first, we need to figure out which way the key is. So I think this is gonna be the correct way. There we 
we go. It snapped in nice. And then here we go. So that was A1. And now we're going to put this in B1. Seated nice. Okay. And then we'll do the same thing for the next kit. So we'll go here and here and then here and here. And then we'll do that same thing repetitively over and over again until we fill um, all 24 attempt slots. So I'm just going to leave the camera on um, and I'll speed this part up. Alrighty guys, I know that was a really long time. Uh, I appreciate you bearing with me there. Um, so now all 24 slots are filled. Uh, it's gonna give us about 100 or about a 1.5 terabytes worth of RAM, um, which I am super pleased about. That's a ton and it's really great uh, for working with a lot of larger data sets and projects. So I am super excited. Okay, so we're gonna put the fans back now. And those just clip in. There we go. And then one more. All right, now, for the moment that we've all been waiting for, um, I am gonna go get the GPUs, and I'm gonna go start um, adding those GPUs. I'm also gonna take a look at these and figure out um, what they are, make sure that they're 12 volt EPS, uh, and then I'll go over all of the uh, stuff related to GPUs. Alrighty guys, so I have confirmed that these guys are 12 volt EPS. Um, so just for clarity, they look, they have this pin out. Oh, well, if I can ever get to focus, there we go. They have this pin out. So um, hopefully this should give you guys, um, you know, a better idea of what um, you are working with and they're really meant for the Tesla series GPUs with um, the like female 12 volt EPS power connector so okay now without further ado I'm gonna go ahead and pop this guy in so this GPU uh, this plate is a little bit screwed up and I also clipped this end piece off um, if you've been watching my channel for a while, you, you probably know that was a mistake. But uh, anyway, so I'm going to use the zip ties and I'm going to zip tie this um, here later. But for now, it's not really going to make that big of a difference, especially since all these are going to be stacked in vertically. They'll kind of support each other. So we're going to go ahead and drop this in the slot very carefully or as carefully as we can anyway. There we go. Cool. So that's in, and you can see that's not super secure. So I'm going to come back later and I'm going to zip tie it uh, to this post here. But for right now, this other GPU that has the correct mounting bracket, I don't really know why they ship with different ones, but you know, whatever. Uh, so we're going to pop this guy in now. And these are both the uh, P100s, by the way, the 16 gigabyte P100s. Um, so these seem to fit in here really nicely. All right, perfect. So that is exactly what it's supposed to look like. It's nice and secure. Um, and then I think I have, I have a little, um, 
nut to put in here. I'll put that in later. But uh, yeah, so that's how those work. And then these guys should just clip right in here. Beautiful. So that's absolutely perfect. Those guys fit like a glove. So that's the finished product um, of the P100s. So now let me grab the two P40s. So, two P40s with the uh, correct mounting hardware or mounting bracket. So we'll go ahead and pop these guys in. So I'm gonna pop everything. I'm gonna pop the first four GPUs in on this side, um, and I'll leave this open for me to try to fit in the the 3090s. Those are gonna produce a lot more heat anyway. So. Um, I think I would rather have those on that side. So there we go. P40 is installed. And now we're gonna clip that guy in. So yeah, I'm really pleased with how all this is turning out. This is fantastic. And I never thought I would see a server that can fit GPUs like this but uh, you know you live and you learn so that is brilliant okay so there you guys have it um, for uh, GPUs so far the P100 and the P40 two of each all connected um, and all pretty much ready to roll. I'm gonna go ahead and go find the hardware, find the screws here and go ahead and secure them. Um, and then I'll zip tie this one. And in the next part, I'll see if I can fit in the 3090s over on that corner. So, all right guys, um, I will see y'all in the next one. All right, guys, so what you're looking at right now, what you can see right now is that the RTX 3090 does fit. However, it's not going to work. So reason why it has both of its power slots pointing up. So there's going to be no way to physically fit these or fit any connectors in to the GPU and then reroute them. Uh, while the GPU is is seated, so um, or not unless you want to cut through the the top of the um, the top I got uh, enclosure or lid. There we go. <laughs> I don't know why I couldn't think of that word. So um, not going to work, or at least not for me. I, I have an external rig already because um, I kind of thought this this might be an issue. Um, there's no reason why it shouldn't work with a PCIe extender. So I'm just as happy letting it live outside of the, um, the server uh, than as inside. It'll actually probably make it cooler to run. So anyway, not a problem for me, but um, just wanted to make you guys aware. Now, with that said, you absolutely can run eight um, Tesla series GPUs in here. Uh, I know for a fact well, I say no for a fact. I haven't turned this on yet, but uh, I know that this is supposed to work for uh, the P40, P100, the K80, uh, the the Volta series GPUs, and I imagine it would work for for Ampere and, and higher as well. I don't see why it wouldn't, um, but uh, I can't I cannot confirm those, uh, and I don't even own them, and they're too expensive, so I won't be able to confirm that for you. But my hunch is that it would work. Um, so anyway, what I'm going to do now is I'm going to go ahead and take this guy, take this out, um, and then I'm going to show you guys the, the PCIe slots, at least these, because they, they mirror this side. Um, and then I'm going to move these two GPUs over, uh, probably to the other side so that it is a little bit cooler or has the opportunity to run a little bit cooler 
and uh, then we'll go from there. So, um... all right, guys. So before I move these uh, GPUs over and space them out, because I only have I only have these four GPUs right now, um, and then I was gonna the the other two 3090s I bought I was gonna put these all in here, but now I'm just going to use the extender and then. All the GPUs are still going to be associated with the server. They're just not all going to be physically in the server. So um, just wanted to, to point out that this can utilize up to six G or eight GPUs. I'm only going to use six just because I, that's all I have. Uh, and I don't have the money right now for any more. But, um, but I just wanted to let you know. So the there are eight PCI-3 by 16 uh, slots. So that would be eight GPUs running at full or having a full 16 lanes um, that you can work with here. Now in the middle, sorry, I'm still on my own light. In the middle, there is, let's see, that's 16. So there is a, a um, eight lane and then another eight lane. And I think these two are, uh, are eight lane. And I don't know if they're split or if they're just eight lane a piece, but either way, these would be single slot. Uh, I'm planning on putting a 10 gig uh, network card in here. So anyway, just wanna make you guys aware of that um, and show you on the actual board. And anyway, now I'm just gonna move these GPUs over uh, and then we'll pretty much be done with this part. We actually have to set up the server itself and um, then I'll make a separate video coming up whenever the rest of the stuff for the external rig comes in and I'll make a video of that. So for now, I'll be operating with four GPUs and in the future, I'll uh, show the external rig and how all that gets set up. So anyway, guys, I'll see you in the next part. All right, guys, so uh, each of the GPUs, or I, I moved two of the GPUs from this side, so one P100 and one P40 to the other side so that they can be spread evenly across the CPUs. Uh, and then whenever we build the external rig, I'm going to take the um, PCIe extenders and either put them here, probably in the middle uh, PCIe slot, just to keep a, a space for airflow between each GPU. And then I'll run those out and then to the external rig uh, for the other um, RTX 3090s. So anyway, that's the plan. Uh, and then if I ever do get some more, I'll just add them um, on these two slots, these two 16 um, lane slots here. So, all right, guys, that about does it for uh, the server setup part. I'm going to put the lid back on and then I'll go ahead and rack it. And then I'll show you guys how to do that. And then we'll go to the software setup for the server. And then we'll install the NVIDIA drivers. And uh, then should be good to go after that. So I'll see you guys in the next part. Okay. So earlier, I removed this outside piece so I can figure out how these bad boys work. Let me take this anti-static wrist thing off. It's driving me crazy. But okay. So this guy works just like this. It extends out. Um, and then if you want to remove this, this piece, which is the easiest way to, to set things up, you press this lever down right here, and then you can slide it out and down this way. And then the whole thing comes out. And then on the back side, you can push this lever and then you can slide everything back together. So this, we're gonna do on both sides. We're gonna take this off and then we're gonna actually put this on the rack first. And then we're gonna slide this whole server, slide these rails. Um, I forget which side is the in. I think it's this side. Anyway, we're gonna slide these rails in um, 
to rack this. Probably be the easiest way to do it. So the other thing I wanna show you um, is to get these on and off. The rails that are supposed to stay with the server. Um, I can find my screwdriver. These come on and off by popping this latch out and then sliding the whole thing back. And it just slides right off and you can do the same thing by uh, to get it back on. I'm not gonna do it right now because it's kind of a pain to get back on with one person. So um, I'm not gonna do that, but I just wanted to show you in case you these rails are removed and you need to figure out how to put them on. Uh, just wanted to show you. So without further ado, I'm gonna take the stuff off the other side and I'll put the rails on the server and then we'll rack it. Alrighty guys, so I've got both of the external part of the racks off. Um, each of these is gonna be flipped up like this uh, and it's going to, with this little um, extended part here facing downward and it's gonna sit, this is gonna clip into the back and then clip into the front um, and I'll show you how. One important thing to note is that this telescopes out so it adjusts to the length of your rack. Very important. I didn't realize this earlier uh, and was a little bit worried these were short, but it telescopes out, so don't worry uh, on that front. Another uh, consideration is this is a 4U server, so this is going to be one, two, three, four uh, units high. Uh, and then we need to, we need the rails to be in line with the second U, so that way the server will slide in uh, like it's supposed to. So we're going to go ahead and we're going to look at this yellow. This needs to face outward. So we're going to go ahead and we're going to try to put the back in first. And I may have to, uh, actually, you know what? We're going to put the front in first. So I'm not going to be able to reach the back. But uh, anyway, what we're going to do is we want the, we want this rail to be in line with eight. So we need to come up one and push, push in, there we go. And then slide and click everything down. Oop, sorry, that was one too high. Push these in, slide it out. So this needs to be right here. Boom. Okay, so that looks right. So um, this piece needs to push in to the top and bottom of the unit that you're interested in. So one more time, if I can get it out, we're gonna push in top and bottom of the second to bottom unit, and then we're gonna slide down. So there we go. Um, I'm gonna go do the same thing on the back side. It's now in place. Okay, one thing to note here, guys, is that not all servers are created equal. And what I mean is not all of them are the same length. So these, uh, the Dell Power Edges below are about 27 inches. This guy is about 29 inches. And then the rack itself ooh, is about 31 inches across. So um, just do be aware that this is gonna be a little bit larger than some of the other ones you have. So you may need to adjust uh, your rack if, if needed uh, for the server. So anyway, guys, sorry I was a little bit long. I just wanted to uh, explain this piece and then the next thing we'll do is we'll rack this uh, and then we'll move on to the next part. All right, guys, um, so we're gonna rack this guy now. It's always better to do this with two people. So got my dad right here as a helper and we're gonna go ahead and see if we can get this thing in. So the idea is each of these is going to slide in to this black part here and you should be able to slide it in just like a drawer. Um, we'll see, <laughs> we'll see how that goes.
All right, guys, so in this section of the video, what we're gonna do is we are going to uh, install the uh, drives into the drive base. So, a um, couple of things here. One, first thing to note, for the uh, this particular server, the Supermicro 4028, um, at least, this particular version um and you let's pull it out just to make sure so this is the model 418g x10 so i just wanted to be explicitly clear about what i was talking about um and of course we covered this in an, a previous a part of the video, but just maybe anybody's watching this part specifically, um, you know, I wanted to be clear before I started talking. Um, anyway, uh, for this particular model, only these four, so this block right here, these eight drives um, are actually wired into the motherboard. Um, and I'll show you guys what I'm talking about here in uh, just a second. But, uh, there is two additional SATA slots, so it looks like you could add two more drives. So basically eight plus two more uh, for a total of 10 drives. And you could do that easily without having to add um, any, you, without having to use any of your PCIe slots. And since this is a, at least for me, this is an AI uh, server basically, um, so we want to pack as many GPUs in here as possible. We don't want to cannibalize or use any of our free PCIe slots. So for me, um, I'm thinking that, and for a lot of people that are doing this, the, the 10 drives are going to be your max. Um, so I just wanted to clarify that before we went any further at this part of the video. All right. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to pause, I'm going to open this thing up and I'm going to show you guys why, and then I'll actually, uh, get into the installation of the drives and then we will uh, go and actually set them or fire the server up, um, and set them up. So, uh, all right, guys. So now we got everything opened up. Um, and I just wanted to show you guys a little bit more of what I was talking about here. Um, so as you can see, we have four, uh, four SATA plugs or, um, SATA ports. And then we also have four on this side as well, um, plus two empties or two that are that are not being used. So zero through uh, three, and then zero through three, and then these orange is four, orange is four and five. So anyway, these go to. Let's try and show you guys the best way I can. I took the fans out and you can see that it clips in um, to like a little bracket or a little receiver here. And it's a specialty part that Supermicro makes. Um, but basically for uh, each of the four SATA slots that we saw earlier plugs into one side of this receiver. Um, and then that's actually what uh, transfers data um, that is what transfers data from each of the drives um, and then power it looks like there's like some Molex or something down here uh, that actually clips in I don't know so this is this is what I don't know I don't know if power is actually available for all of these 24 slots I haven't actually figured that out um, for me, it's kind of irrelevant, so I'm only going to try to use eight, but that is probably something to consider. Looks like it might be. Um, but either way, you're going to need uh, basically a bunch. You only have two other um, SATA ports here that you can use for data transfer. So... Um, what you probably need to do is, if you wanted, you could just use two kind of loose hanging drives and use these SATA ports uh, for data transfer and then maybe use, uh, there's a free 
it looks like a USB port right there. Um, looks like maybe a 12 volt EPS here. But anyway, you could you could maybe find some other power sources to power those drives. Um, and then just let them kind of like be like loose hanging um, and just kind of sit, you know, in the chassis somewhere if you wanted. That was not a great way to do it, but that's something you could do. Another thing you could do is also cannibalize some of these PCIe slots back here that you're not using. Um, and, you know, get basically get whatever part would allow you to, um, you know, basically go from PCIe to, uh, I guess, clip into whatever these, these things I just showed were. So those guys, uh, I'm sure that Super Micro, Super Micro makes a part for that, but I'm not sure what it is off the top of my head. But anyway, guys, I just wanted to um, highlight that or touch on that a little bit to kind of give you an idea of what you're working with because you, know, you may want to do something different than me and it always helps to understand kind of what you're getting into. So I hope that was helpful. And if you have any more specific questions, please feel free to drop in the comments. And I'll do my best to, to answer them. But um, anyway, that's as much as I know. And um, without further ado, we'll get into the next part. We'll get the... All right, guys. So um, now it's time to actually put uh, the drives in the caddies. And then we'll slide them back in and we'll actually get to setting them up. But first, I want to kind of go over what I'm doing and why. And uh, the first thing is I've already got two drives set up with um, some new uh, team group, two terabyte um, SSDs. And these I'm gonna set up as um, RAID 1. And uh, I'm gonna have these give me some level of uh, redundancy. That way if something happens, I can just pop one out, pop a new one back in. Um, and all the core files in the OS um, you know, should be good to go. So that's the first two guys right here. Uh, the next four are going to be for basically data. Um, you know, any, any large files or things that don't necessarily need to be um, you know, persistent for the long term um, are gonna be loaded in here. And I have four, uh, excuse me, four, and actually I don't wanna say loaded for the long term, that's not necessarily true. Just things, basically anything that's too big to fit on the OS and isn't like pertinent to uh, the management of the machine, I'm gonna store here. So I just wanna make that clarification. Um, but the I'm gonna use four um, eight terabyte Samsung 870 QVOs. Um, these are pretty expensive. Um, you know, I think if you remember correctly, they were about 500 bucks a piece. So, uh, you know, this is really just about all I could afford. And this is really all I need. Uh, 24 gigs should be just fine for, for, uh, for now and for, for what I'm doing uh, at this stage. Um, you know, plus I'm using one of my other servers, a storage server. So uh, worst case, I can just transfer data on and off of this, but we'll, that, we'll get into that later. But um, anyway, so the reason you're asking, okay, why, why 24? Well, I'm gonna set this up in RAID 5 so that I have um, you know, some redundancy here as well. So it sucks to burn a full disc, but you know, I, I, I do want some redundancy. So anyway, so this is gonna set up, these are gonna be set up um, in a uh, RAID 5 configuration, and I'm gonna go ahead and unbox these and start putting them in. I'll do one just to show you, in case you've never put one in before, um, what that looks like. Um, and then I'll skip to the next part where I put them in and then show you guys how to set up the virtual drives. All right, so we're gonna go ahead and open this guy up. And by the way, this is uh, 560 megabytes read and 530 megabytes write. So, well, that's what it says anyway. So we'll see if that's actually true at some point. But there we go. That's what the guy looks like. And um, go ahead pop this guy in. So what you want to do is you want to set it face down inside the caddy and then pop in four screws. I'm only going to put two in because that's really all you need. Um, and I just had these from some other stuff I was working on. Um, but if you don't, 
you may need to order uh, some, I guess, caddy screws. I've never actually had to order these. Um, and I'm not 100% sure what size to even tell you guys to get, but I'll do some research and I'll put that in the video description, along with you know anything else I think that might be helpful, um, like the super micro part numbers of the, um, you know, the SATA drive clips, so those interesting, um, you know, eight bay drive um, parts, I guess you could say. So I'll put those in the video description once I can figure out what they are in case anyone's interested. All right, so anyway, we're gonna put this guy here. And should be pretty simple. Just screws right in there. Boom. And then we'll do one more. All right, great. Not going anywhere. You don't really need all four screws. You can put them if you want, but those things are kind of precious <laughs> because I don't have, um, that's all I have. But anyway, so there we go. So we're gonna do exact, the other three exactly like this, and then we're gonna go ahead and pop them back in, um, and then we're ready to start getting everything set up. All righty guys, um, so now every, now all the drives uh, are loaded in the caddies. Um, we're gonna go ahead and put everything back in. So just slide these guys in just like so, making it look hard with one hand, but with the uh, uh, red levers, or the red lashes down, push it all the way in and then click it. Oop, hold on, it's not all the way. There we go. So click it all the way in and then push down, and there you go. And we'll do the other ones like that. And if you wanna take it back out, just push down, and then, you know, do like so. It's pretty self-explanatory. I'm just showing this for anybody that may be completely new to servers in general, um, you know, watching this. I imagine there's probably not a lot of people that, that applies to, but, you know, I just, want to always be clear so that nobody watching this video is like, man, like, how does he do that? So anyway, I assume this is a little bit remedial for some of you guys. I apologize. I'm just trying to make sure that everyone can understand. Okay. Now, all right, guys. So we're going to get uh, started setting up the drives in this part of the video. Um, I just did it to make sure that I knew how it took me a lot longer than I expected. But um, what I found out may be helpful to you so i want to point this out before we go any further so um there is a sata controller and then an s sata controller and they both control um different parts of these eight eight plus two possible drives in the back so what i mean by that is for example i have changed all of my long-term storage drives or all of these samsung drives to be these first four drives because these I believe are the SATA controller okay so you can have it looks like up to a four disc array with that controller and then for these four you can have up to an eight disc array or sorry up to a six disc array with the uh, S SATA controller so anyway what I did is I moved these two over to the S SATA um, controller or, or the, the drive bays that will allow me to use the S SATA uh, controller. So it's, just, it's a subtle thing, it's a simple thing, but it actually does make a difference. So basically, since I'm only planning on, on these four being in a uh, RAID 5 and these two are gonna be in RAID 1, um, I just move these over and then it gives me four other, so these two plus two I could possibly put in internally to give me another um, four disc, uh, you know, RAID setup of some kind. Um, you know, I could also replace this later possibly with a six disc setup 
Um, but anyway, it just, this is what works best for me. So I just wanted to point that out here that um, these do not function as, like you can't take all eight of these and make it into um, a single RAID array. So that's weird, but that's what it seems like is possible. So, you know, as you guys watch this in the comments, if something, you know, I'm doing something wrong or maybe I've missed something, please let me know. But um, I just wanted to point that out before we um, get started. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna go ahead and power this on um, and then I'll show you guys how to get into uh, the setup and we'll go from there. All right guys, so we've got everything powered on now. Um, we're going through the boot sequence and uh, here in just a bit, we should be able to get into the setup utility. So we're gonna go ahead uh, here in just a second and start pressing the delete button. That's going to get us into the setup utility and then we will go from there. So I'm just gonna fast forward now until we actually get to that part. Um, and then I'll show you guys um, how to set up the disks or how to set up um, everything for the loading of the OS in the next part. So, okay, we're gonna hit the delete button. There we go, so we're gonna enter the setup and we'll give this just a second. All right guys, so we're in the setup utility. Um, so I'm gonna go through exactly what I did to get everything set up the way that I wanted it. Um, and this should kind of give you a good idea overall um, of how things work. So, you know, feel free to tweak whatever you need for your particular use case. All right, so um, we're gonna go into advanced. And the first thing I'm gonna change is uh, the boot feature called power button function. And right now it's instant off. And we're gonna change that to four second override. So all this does is it makes it so that you have to hold the power button for four seconds before the device powers off, rather than just hitting it uh, like you know, one click and then powering off. I like this because just in case, you know, I hit this with my knee while I'm sitting it in front of the server or um, I don't know, something dog goes by and like brushes it or whatever. I just don't want the server to turn off accidentally. Um, I want it to, you know, make sure that the server should be turning off, you know, when the button is pressed. So anyway, this is a safety feature that I kind of like. So I'm gonna go ahead and enable that. Um, C C CPU configuration, um, let's go down and very end is advanced power management configuration. Um, and we're not gonna do a whole lot in here, but what I, the reason why I bought this setup is for maximum performance. So I'm changing the performance bias to performance rather than um, you know, balanced or um, you know, power saving. So anyway, this is a personal choice. Um, you know, if you'd rather be more energy efficient, totally go for it. Uh, but for me, I want the maximum performance of this machine. So I'm gonna adjust uh, the bias here. I am the bias here, I should say. Um, I am going to leave energy efficient and uh, energy efficient turbo. I'm not sure these will have a huge effect, but I guess, um, you know, I'm gonna leave them. So, you know, if there is a chance we can be a little more energy efficient while still being performant, that's fine. But uh, I just wanted to adjust the bias so we have the, the, <laughs> the best chance of being uh, as performant as possible. So anyway, that's um, change number two. Let's make sure, there we go. Um, all right, next, don't need anything here. Now, so what I was talking about earlier, so we have SATA and SSATA. Um, so I believe this is basically stands for secondary SATA. So we have two different SATA controllers um, on this machine that we can use. So we'll go ahead and configure uh, the first one. And as you can see what I was talking about, this is, this is the SATA controller. Um, and let's see how many ports this has. This, this has. this is the one that has six. Okay, so the zero through three are the first four that actually come from the drive bays. And then, then, then four and five are the ones that we looked at inside the server that you could possibly have maybe some, some loose drives um, you know, inside the server. Um, so anyway, that the SATA controller is what is actually gonna control those. So we're gonna go ahead and set that as RAID. 
um, we're going to go with EFI and we're going to change everything to EFI, by the way, because, um, you know, unless you really need backward compatibility, this is just a, a much better way to go. Um, okay. And then we are going to have this as SATA controller. Okay. This is the SATA configuration and we're going to let the SATA controller control, um, this, uh, or these raid arrays. Uh, okay, so let's select this and put this as SSD. Um, we'll put this as SSD. Um, hot plug is enabled. This means you can um, take the disk in and out or this drive, the disk in this drive bay in and out while the server is running. Spin up is disabled. So as long as all of these are disabled, then all disks will basically be accessible on startup. Otherwise, if it is enabled, but only the disks that are enabled will be able to be accessed, um, you know, after boot. So just keep that in mind. So we'll basically just keep that as default as well. Um, and that's pretty much all we need to do here for SATA. Um, one caveat I want to talk about is you may be able to set these, set both SATA and SATA to the same controller and then manage all of the disks for a larger array. I haven't tried that to be honest with you. Um, but since they're two separate controllers and I can only see basically all of the disks on one and the other, I doubt that works. And uh, I don't really wanna try all this again. So maybe that's something you could try. But for me, I know this works, so I'm gonna go with it. Um, basically, I'm gonna let the SATA controller control all of these disks and I'm gonna let the S SATA controller control the others. So anyway, um, we're gonna set this as rate as well change this to EFI. Um, we're going to let this be controlled by the S SATA controller. Um, again, these things are all the same. Um, we're going to change all of these to solid state drives. Okay. Okay. All right, cool. And you know, what I was talking about earlier, so there's only four drives that this one controls and that works out because I only have four discs. So that is why I swapped everything over to this um, so that this, this, the SATA controller could control these disks for a four disk array. Um, all right. So that should be everything here. Um, one note here, just because I was curious and I looked it up, um, the configure as eSATA, this apparently is so that you, if you want a, a external drive to be in this bay that you're going to be using a lot, um, I guess taking in and out, you can enable this and it has some sort of, um, like speed up properties for disks that are uh, used in that manner. So anyway, um, it's not relevant to me, but it might be to you. So I just wanted to highlight that. Um, all right, next thing we wanna do, we wanna go in here and we want to configure our PCIe slots. And these are all legacy. So we're gonna change all of this over to EFI, 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 EFI. EFI, 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 EFI. Okay, cool. Now, um, we are gonna change this to EFI as well. Um, and then we're gonna change the LAN option to EFI. And then, so network stack, if you want to pixie boot or you know network boot or whatever you wanna call it, um, you might wanna enable this. I never plan to use that, to be honest with you. So this is really just a security risk for me. So I'm just gonna leave it disabled. All right, um, that should be all here. Um, and the only other thing, I'm just go and make sure I'm not missing anything. Uh, ah, yes, boot. This is what I messed up one of the other times. All right, so this has dual. We wanna change this to UEFI because we don't care about any of the other stuff now because everything for us is set to EFI. Um, all right, so that should work. And then the last thing we wanna do is go over to save and exit and um, save changes and yes. Um, and then we're also gonna just save changes and reset here in a second. But before we do that, I wanna say, if you need to reset 
um, back to the factory defaults if you mess anything up or something's not working correctly. The easiest way to do that is just to come in here to restore optimized defaults um, and then hit yes and then you can go and save your changes um, and then it will reset everything back to factory. Well, let me rephrase that. Save changes and reset and then once you reboot, everything will be back to uh, basically factory defaults. In fact, I just did this so I could redo all this for you guys for this video. Um, but anyway, for us, we've got all of our changes saved. Um, we're going to go ahead and save changes and reset. Uh, and then I'll show you guys how to configure the um, drives, configure each of the drives in its own RAID configuration in the next part of the video. All right, you guys, so uh, we're back. The machine's reset. Um, I have pressed the delete button again on boot to get back into the setup utility. Um, and now what you should notice is when we go to the advanced tab, we now see that there are these other options. So um, basically these are what we're interested in. So the SSATA and SATA controller. Uh, and then these are, um, have a, a um, basically a network card that I installed that has two 10 gigabit ports, and that's what these are, I believe. So I guess whenever I change to EFI, it, it just picked these up, and we can now uh, adjust different settings related to them. But just wanted to tell you what those are, so that you, in case you're curious. But this is what we're focused on. Um, as you can see, I've, I've already, the, the RAID volume, I, I've already created in the, the previous part. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna delete it. Um, yes, so we'll go ahead and create uh, a new one. So this is going to be called, and you can call this whatever you want, but for me, this is long-term storage and it's RAID 5. So it's a pretty simple name. This helps me rem remember why I do stuff. Um, this is RAID 5. Okay. Uh, and then we're going to set all of the, oop, all of the disks by hitting the space bar to be part of this, um, volume or RAID array volume, whatever you want to call it. And then we're going to create this um, create this volume. Okay, so that's what you should see whenever you've successfully created it. And then the next thing we're going to do is we're going to come down here and we are going to do the same thing for other two disks. So we'll go ahead and we'll delete this. Yes, we want to delete it. Create the RAID volume. And for me, this is going to be the, boot, the bootable drive and it's going to contain all the files that I really want to persist um, you know, long-term on my machine. Uh, and this will be RAID 1. So I have uh, basically another copy. And this is useful because I like to be able to basically take uh, a disk out, have a total copy of my OS and all the, the, thing, the important files, and I can stick it in another machine. And it's kind of, it makes it easy to kind of uh, move drives around and, and kind of build an, a new server. <laughs> Uh, more or less with um, a drive that is already kind of configured the way that I want it. So um, plus two, it's just easier. That way, if something happens to your OS, you don't have to you know rebuild everything from scratch. Uh, it just it's I found in my experience that it, this works out nicely. So that's why I'm choosing to do it this way. Yeah, it sucks to lose you know a lot of storage, but you know it, it has paid off for me in in over the years to have it this way. So anyway, all right, so we've got boot, RAID 1, RAID 1 mirror, um, cool, everything's good here. All right, at this point, guys, everything um, should be set up, and what we should be able to do now is we're going to, again, we're going to save changes and reset, uh, and then on the next boot, we're not going to do anything, we're just going to let it go through the, the full boot sequence, and then um, it should basically um, take us to the Ubuntu, or rather, it should boot to our um, our USB stick, which Ventoy has all of our utilities on there, and one of those is the Ubuntu ISO, and then we'll use that to actually boot um, and set up Ubuntu on this machine. So that's what we'll do now. All right, guys, so now we're upstairs. Um, what I'm gonna do is I have an old drive um, and we're gonna create a bootable drive out of this. 
And what I like to do is create a bootable drive and then also put some other utilities that are useful and just leave it plugged in, in the machine. That way, if you have iDRAC or some other uh, management tool, you can use it or use it to, you know, in extreme cases, reboot the machine or um, use the um, Ubuntu files or ISOs we're going to have on there so that you can actually boot into a command line to, to fix things. It's, it's a nice, useful tool. So that's what we're going to do here. So I'm going to go ahead and just plug this guy in. Um, and OK, cool. I, I, just, I already had PFSense installed on this. So we're just going to go ahead and overwrite it. Um, but the program we're going to look at, or we're going to go find, is called um, Ventoy. Ventoy. There we go. OK, so if you don't have it already, um, you know, go here to downloads and then get whatever is, uh, you know, relevant to you. It looks like, uh, there's windows and Linux. Those are what I use primarily. I haven't tried this on Mac. Um, so anyway, get what applies to you, pull it down, unzip it. Um, I've already done that. So let's look over here. So Ventoy. Uh, and there should be an executable. So we'll go ahead and run that. All right, cool. And that's what that looks like. Um, so as you can see, it found uh, the disk that I'm interested in. So we're going to, going to go ahead. Um, okay, sorry, I just want to double check something, guys. Um, but basically, Whenever you're ready, hit this install button. It's going to wipe and reformat uh, whatever uh, stick you have in here, or, or sorry, drive you have in here. Uh, and then once it's done, what you can do is you can take the ISO files, whatever ISO files you want, and you can drop them in there, and they will be available to you uh, on boot. So I actually just did this. So uh, I'm not going to do it in, do it again because it actually takes a minute. But uh, basically, when it's you're finished. Um, Sorry, what it looks like is it's gonna say Ventoy and then whatever um, whatever particular uh, drive it is, drive letter will show up. Um, and at this point, what you can do is you can take your ISOs. So I have already these ISO files I always use. So I use Gparted, Clonezilla, and uh, I like Ubuntu twenty two oh four. So those are three I use in a minimum. Sometimes, depending on what I'm doing, I add other <clears throat> a few other things. Um, but yeah, guys, this is going to take a little bit. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and pause the video. And as soon as it's done, um, I'll come back. All right, guys, so we're back. And everything is downloaded nicely. So the next thing we're going to do is uh, we're going to go ahead and eject this and then we're going to go downstairs and we're going to pop it in the server, fire everything up and pray to God that all the hardware uh, is installed correctly and uh, is working. So I'll see you guys in the next part. All right, guys, so now we so all I did is I turned the machine back on. I let it go through the boot sequence and it naturally booted uh, into Ventoy. Uh, which we have installed on our USB stick from earlier. And then as you can see, we now have, we can go to Clonezilla if we need to clone a drive. We can go to Gparted if we needed to um, adjust some drives or partitions or whatever the case. And then we also have uh, Ubuntu, Ubuntu 2204, uh, which we can uh, use to load onto our machine. So that's what we're gonna do now. We'll select Ubuntu. And then we'll, we'll boot in normal mode. And then now we want to try our install Ubuntu server. And now we'll let it do its thing. And it'll eventually take us to the Ubuntu boot menu, or I guess uh, setup GUI, I should say. Alrighty guys. Um, so now we are at the setup GUI uh, for Ubuntu. So we're gonna go ahead and we'll get this set up real quick. Um, all right, so first thing we need to pick our language. For me, I'm gonna say English. Um, and this is optional, but I'm gonna update to the new installer. 
Okay, so now um, you're gonna wanna select your keyboard layout. Uh, I've already, you know, I'm, I'm fine with English US, that works for me. Um, I'm also fine with the uh, default install of Ubuntu server. So I'm gonna go ahead and get it done. Um, it's nice enough that it has found, or my DATP server has given me a DATP assignment. So we're good there. We can go ahead and get it done. I'm not gonna use a proxy, so this is irrelevant for me. Um, and then we're gonna um, test our mirror location. All right, excellent. Um, so now we'll move on to the next part. Okay, so it's picked up our RAID configuration, so that's good. Um, but we want to use our, oops, sorry. There we go. All right, so we, we wanna use uh, our RAID 1 drive. So this is this one right here. That's what we want to use, what we, where we want Ubuntu to live. So we're gonna select that guy and we're gonna hit done. Um, and then by default, sorry guys, by default, Ubuntu is gonna go ahead and create uh, all these partitions on that disk. So that's what this VG is. And then you have whatever's left over is the free space. So free space on that drive to do whatever you want with. So for me, what I normally like to do is I'll create logical volume. Um, you can name this whatever you want. Um, I'm just gonna leave it as LV0. Um, and then I'm going to leave it the format is ext4. I like it's it's Ubuntu's default, and it's a pretty good general file system, so no worries there. And then we'll mount it at home, which is you know a logical place for it to be, and and we'll hit create. So there we go. We now have about 1.7 terabytes in our home directory to work with. Uh, next. We have already formatted this before, but for you guys, this will probably say unformatted. Um, so what we'll do is we'll just reformat um, and we'll put this as ext4. Again, good general file system. And then I like to mount this. Uh, so this is going to be uh, M M N T. so for mount. And then I like to mount it as MNT uh, LTS. Basically, it's a mounted drive and it's my long-term storage. So um, that's just a convention I've used in the past that works well, and uh, I'm gonna keep it consistent. But feel free you know, to do whatever you want here, guys. Okay, so now we've got everything configured um, and mounted at, at the correct uh, locations. So we can go through and we can hit done. And it says, hey, we're gonna wipe everything on these drives, are you cool with that? Yeah, we're cool with it. Okay, now let's go put our information in. So this is gonna be Spencer King. Sorry, I'm slow guys, I'm trying to type around the camera. Um, all right, and then the server's name. This is gonna be a bit long, but I'm gonna follow my um, traditional convention for all the other servers. So it's just SDK uh, and then SM4028, which, Sorry, GR, which is the model of the server. So Supermicro 4028, I think it's GPU ready, I believe. Uh, and then I put the name of the operating system or the flavor of the operating system. So this is Ubuntu 2204. And then I like to put the last four of the, um, the SN serial number. So this is 7824. Okay, so now I pick a username. I always use SDK hence the SDK at the beginning of the server name, and then um, the password, type the password in, and then we'll confirm it again. And if all that worked, all right, great. So do I wanna enable Ubuntu Pro? No, I do not. And then do I want to install OpenSSH server? I'll go ahead and install that, sure. And then I don't really want any of this stuff. I'll download whatever I want later. And there we go. So now we're gonna let that install. All right guys, looks like the installation is complete. Um, so we're gonna go ahead and um, reboot now. And then I will 
uh, show you guys how to finish setting up the rest of the server. Alrighty guys, um, so I just want to let this thing boot all the way through to make sure that it was working correctly. So all I did is I turned it back on, let it go through the full boot sequence, it, boot it booted uh, into Ubuntu server, and now we'll see if we can log in. So that was my user, and then I'll type my password in. All right, excellent. So there we go, guys. Um, that should be working. Uh, also, one thing I wanna check is, see if the uh, SSH service is started. It should be. All right, cool, so that's that's running. So anyway, what that means is we should be able to access this from, you know, uh, we should be able to access we should be able to SSH into the server. So rather than sitting down here in the cold basement in this uncomfortable chair anymore, I'm gonna go upstairs uh, and finish the rest of this from there. So. All right, you guys, so here we are back upstairs um, and we're gonna go ahead and set up basically all the, um, the software side of the server. And I just wanna give a couple of, um, I guess, quick notes here. Um, if you want to watch the whole thing, great. Some of this stuff may or may not apply to you depending on what you want to do. I'm just going to show you how I like to set the server up. So take what you want, take what you don't, totally up to you. Um, but I think this would be helpful maybe for people that are new or maybe just looking for ideas of how to maybe better set up a server. Um, but anyway, I guess what I'm trying to say is you can skip this if you want, if you already know what you're doing um, and you know, take from this what you will. All right, so first thing, we're gonna go ahead and test out the SSH connection. Um, so SSH, I have already SSH'd in before, and I know that it's working, um, but just to show you guys, there we go. Okay, so you can see username at the same um, host name we created downstairs. Um, so now that we're in, we want to do a couple of things. So first thing I always like to do is sudo apt um, update dash y. I'm gonna go ahead and get that going. Okay, so that wasn't too horrible. I think it already updated whenever whenever we were installing it, so it shouldn't be too horrible, hopefully. Um, so now we'll do sudo apt upgrade dash y. Okay, um, we'll just go ahead and start all the services. So we'll hit enter or restart whatever services need to be restarted. Um, all right, so now there are just some basic things I always like to have. So um, sudo apt install, oops, install wgit. Um, and okay, that's already, looks like it's already installed. Okay, um, sudo apt install nano. Okay, that's installed as well. Um, sudo apt install unzip and zip. Okay, great. So those should be, let me just make sure that both of those installed correctly. Yes, zip. Let's see. I think it installed zip. Let me just, let me make sure those are installed. So install zip, done, unzip. Okay, cool. So those are all good. Um, all right, now the next thing I always like to do, uh, and again, this is optional at this point, um, I'm just going to show you in case you want to do it. But I like to create an SSH uh, key for the server. One, because I'm lazy and I want to type my password in. And two, because it's just more secure. Um, so the first thing we're going to do is we need to actually create the key. And I do this fairly frequently, so I already had the command saved. Um, but basically what this is telling us, or what we're, what we're saying here is, hey, I want to create um, a key pair. I want it to be RSA and I want it to have, or in this case, be 
um, 4,906 bits um, or bytes. I forget which. I think it's I think it's bits. Uh, anyway, it doesn't really matter. It's it's the it's very secure. Um, and then we're gonna have it output to um, our SSH folder, and we're gonna call it the exact same thing that we named our server, um, which was this. And I just do this for convention sake because it's just easier to remember this stuff. Okay, so cool. We're gonna generate that key pair. I'm not gonna use a passphrase because it just defeats the purpose of not having to use a password. Um, and the only way that I the only way that I allow access to this is in my local network. So you either have to be behind the VPN I have set up or in my local network. So it's it's as secure as I want to make it. But you know, if you want to do something different, you know, uh, please feel free. Um, okay. So now what we want to do is we have our key pairs generated. So let's go and check those out. Um, so here we go. There we go. New public key. And then somewhere in here should be a private key. Um, all right. So what we want to do now is we want to go back into our server. Um, so let's go back here and let's type our password in. Okay, and then now what we want to do here is we want to CD into our SSH folder and we should have an authorized keys already generated. And then we want to sudo nano authorized keys. Oop. All right, and what we're going to do is we're going to paste the public key we had before. So we're going to paste this guy. So I'm not going to do this on camera, but we're going to open it in notepad. Well, I hope it doesn't open. Let's try it open with notepad. All right, there we go. Um, and we're gonna paste this guy in. Okay, sorry, I'm just trying to grab it all. All right, so we're gonna do this and we're gonna go ahead and paste it in. And that way you don't see the whole thing. And not that it really matters that much anyway, but just for security, um, that should be fine. So we pasted the key in. And now our key um, is in authorized keys. So that we should be good to go there. Um, and now um, what we should be able to do is we should be able to exit out and we should be able to change this command slightly and we should be able to say dash I. Um, and then we want the home directory and then the SSH folder um, and then uh, our private key, which is the same name as our server. So we can post that, paste that guy in there. And anyway, now we should, if we did everything correctly, we shouldn't have to, oh, I did forget one thing. So this isn't gonna work. Oh, okay, I guess it did work. Normally, sometimes you have to reset um, or restart the uh, SSH service. So it would be sudo service, or you could use systemctl sudo service, um, SSH restart. Um, I guess in this case, it's only when you, or I guess it's only when you change the configuration files. But um, anyway, if you need to restart it, that's how you would do it. Uh, in this case, it just needed us to paste that in the authorized key file. So anyway, all right. So now uh, at this point, we no, no longer have to use a password. Um, and one of the things I like to do here is I like to actually alter the SSH config file so that there is, you cannot use plain text passwords. So, uh, and then a couple other security settings will adjust as well. So, um, okay, so what we're gonna need to do is we're gonna need to CD uh, into ETC and then we need to CD into SSH. All right, and this is where all of our SSH uh, configuration files live. So the first thing I always like to do is CD into SSD. There we go. And go ahead and just delete this file because if we actually open it in nano, uh, and this happens to me frequently, 
uh, type my password in. Okay, so see how that says password authentication? Yes. So if you don't delete this, then no matter what you do in the traditional SSH configuration files, this will keep you keep the password enabled. Um, I found that out the hard way because I couldn't figure out why the password was still enabled and took me way longer than it should have. So anyway, what we're going to do is we're going to remove this file because we don't need it. Um, yes. Okay, I guess I need sudo remove 50. There we go. All right, so that's gone. Next thing, just for uh, precaution's sake, we will go into um, the SSH, not SSHD, and make sure there's nothing hiding there. All right, cool. So both of those are clean. Um, the next thing we want to do is we want to sudo uh, nano SSH uh, config. Oh, that's not right. Sorry, guys. Nano SSH. Turn that off. It's annoying me. Okay, um, so sudo nano ssh, oh, I'm sorry, I'm still in this directory, that's why I can't find it. All right, so now we'll sudo nano into ssh config, and now we'll adjust some things in here. Um, so you, you ideally can leave this all as default, but for me, what I like to do is I like to be explicit um, so password authentication for me is going to be no, just to make that explicitly clear. Um, and the rest of the stuff you can leave, um, pretty much as default and we'll go ahead and exit. And then now we'll go into SSHD configuration. Um, and we will do a bunch of stuff. So we'll leave this as default, we'll keep going down. Okay, so here we go. Um, first things, login grace time. You can leave as two minute. I'm gonna set it as one. Still, like, I mean, you really it shouldn't take that long for you to log in. So one minute is more than enough. I've found. Um, permit root login, and the answer is yes. Sorry, actually, the <laughs> I meant to say permit root login is no. We do not want to, to allow. Um, anybody to log in uh, as root. We can always change to root once we're in if we need to. Um, and then I, al I also like to adjust these explicitly. Um, and we'll set this as 10 and 10. Public key authentication is going to be yes. Again, don't have to set it here, but I like to be explicit. Authorized key files, we'll look for them in authorized keys or authorized keys too. Uh, you could probably delete the second one if you want. Uh, I'm just going to leave that as default. And um, let's see. Don't need any of this stuff. Here we go. Password authentication is going to be no. So we do not want to allow password authentication. And we do not want to permit uh, empty passwords. So, and again, that you didn't have to uncomment that. But I like to uncomment all the things that I want to be explicitly stated. Um, okay, so we do not want any interactive. So like if you were using, like for example, Duo, or like a, a two-factor authentication sign-in, you might have to enable this. Um, I have actually another video on this if you're curious. Um, okay, use PAM's fine. That's fine. All of this stuff is fine. Oh, and the only the uh, one of the other things I like is to set this and just reduce this to fifty. Just make things a bit more secure, uh, and then I'm gonna pause this to make sure there's nothing else that I normally change. All right, guys. So uh, that should pretty much be everything. Um, and anyway, I, I don't think I explained this as well, so I'm gonna do that. Um, this basically just means. Uh, we can allow up to 10 authenticated or sorry, 10 unauthenticated connections. And then after that, we'll have a 30% chance of dropping any new connections up to 50. Um, and then basically 50 or more authentications, we drop all new incoming connections. And this is basically for 
um, uh, DDoS attacks or denial of service attacks. So I mean, not something super common that you'll probably have to ever worry about. But um, you know, I just as a general rule, this is how I, how I like to set things, and um, you know, just wanted to share that with you guys. So okay, um, now we're going to do Control S or um, I guess Control O, and then uh, what is the other method? Control O and then enter and then you can hit exit so whichever way that you prefer but save your changes let's make sure that all of our stuff has been saved all right cool so everything's saved correctly um so now what we want to do is we want to do sudo service or you can use system ctl as well um ssh restart and then status to make sure everything is running still or running now boom Okay, so everything's running. Um, at this point, what we should be able to do is exit out, and then we can try this again. But let's just say that we give the wrong key. So good. So we're being denied because we are not presenting the correct public key. It's not asking us to give a password instead. So that's good. Um, now let's try it again with the correct command, and it should work. Okay, beautiful. So we didn't lock ourselves out, and we can now now, now no longer use passwords. So beautiful. That's exactly what we what we wanted. Um, we can move on to the next part. So do apologize that was a bit long, but I, I wanted to explain that because you know this is something I use quite often, and um, you know do it in every single one of my servers. Um, okay, next thing after setting up SSH, we want to. I always set the root password. Um, you don't have to but I find it's, it's good practice. So you can do that a couple of different ways. You can say sudo uh, password root, and then type in the uh, your password, and then you can type in the root password. And I always make the root password different than what my actual pass or what my user password is. Um, it's longer and scarier. as it should be. And then another way you could have done that is you could have said sudo su root and that would have taken your root and you could just say password and then that'll ask you to change the password and I'm not going to do that. Okay. So anyway, so now we've set our root password. Um, the next thing that we, we need to do is, uh, let's see here. So root password, okay, we need to set up our, our firewall now. So these are just all security things that, that I normally do. So at this point, um, let's just run another apt upgrade and update, make sure nothing else has changed. I'm sure nothing has, but better to be safe than sorry. Okay, cool, so that's done. Now let's we're gonna install um, sudo apt install ufw. Okay, cool, it's already installed. Um, so the next thing that we need to do is we need to go into, um, our system config. So we'll say CD ETC system, or sorry, sysctl.conf. Oh, sorry. That's not a directory. We'll CD into ETC and then we will um, sudo nano sysctl.conf. And then what we want to do here, this is a small thing that you, you may not even really need to, need to do, honestly. Um, but just to enable forwarding, um, you have to uncomment this line. If you, if you want forwarding, um, if you want to forwarding to be enabled, then you need to uncomment this line. So, um, you know, for some, for a lot of people, it probably wouldn't make a difference. Sometimes I, I, I do use this. So, um, you know, I, I like to go ahead and do it while I'm setting everything up. Um, and then we need to um, run this command to reset everything. Sorry, system CTL not 
the other way around. There we go. Um, and now we should be able to find it in UFW. And, you'll, and I'll show you what I mean here in just a second. But what I always like to do is I like to start out by saying sudo um, UFW default. So basically adjusting the defaults. They should already be set this way, but um, it never hurts to verify. So basically sudo UFW default allow outgoing. Okay. Um, and then we want to do the same thing, but instead of uh, allow outgoing, we want to deny incoming. And then we also want to uh, deny routed. So we basically enable this and we're going to deny it manually. So, uh, and then finally, we want to off the bat, we want to. Um, allow SSH. So now we can actually enable everything without exposing ourselves or locking ourselves out. So enable, sorry, so if UFW, oh my gosh, enable. Yes. Okay, great. So now let's take a look and see what this looks like. So sudo ufw status, and then I always like to include the verbose command so we can see exactly what's going on. And that allows us, it tells us what our defaults are. So um, earlier, the reason why we did, we adjusted the um, sysctl config file is because otherwise this would have been disabled, not just denied, but we wouldn't even have had the ability to use it if we wanted to. So now at least we're consciously denying this routed traffic. Um, so subtle, but something that may cause you issues in the future if you don't handle it now. So anyway, so we've opened everything or we've, we've set up UFW. So we now have a firewall uh, engaged with the correct default rules um, to keep us safe. And then we've allowed SSH access, um, which should be perfectly fine for now. Okay. And you can always go back and change this later. You know, some common things you might want to do is you could um, allow port 80, port 440, 433, 443, uh, HTTPS. Um, I'm blanking on the exact port right now. But anyway, there are some common ones that you might want to allow in. Um, so you can do that if you, if you want as well at this point. But I'm just going to allow uh, 20, port 22 for SSH in. Um, okay. Next thing for me is I am going to go ahead and set up the NVIDIA drivers. Um, this is super important and the whole point of the server for me. So uh, it's important that they are set up and work correctly. So we got sudo Ubuntu drivers and then we want to list out all of the devices. So that will take just a minute. Okay. So here we go. It is going to recommend the latest driver. So that's great. Um, and in this case, for me, since this is a server we're setting up, I'm going to use the server version. So the only difference here is we're going to use, instead of the recommended NVIDIA driver 535, we're going to use the NVIDIA driver 535 server. So the way to install that is sudo apt install. And then we're going to go ahead and copy and paste this guy and pop them in there and yes all right guys uh looks like that finally installed it took a really long time um but it says which services should be restarted um i'm gonna hit enter so whatever um whatever it needs to be restarted it will restart okay um so that's done. The NVIDIA driver should be installed now. Um, unfortunately, at this point, um, if I run NVIDIA SMI, uh, it's, we're not going to be able to find it because it needs to reboot to kind of finish the installation process. But I don't really want to do that right now because we're right in the middle of loading all the other stuff. So, And there are going to be other things we'll install that will also need to be rebooted. So what we're going to do, 
for the sake of time is I'm going to continue installing um, some other stuff and then I'll reboot once at the end and we'll make sure everything works. So uh, hold that for now. And next thing we're going to want to do or next thing I want to do is I want to install Docker. I love Docker. I use Docker all the time. Um, and that's what we're going to install next. So, and I've, I've actually copied this from, from Docker's website. So I'm going to follow their procedure. So sudo apt git install CA certificates. So we'll go ahead and install that first and then install, uh, this command. And this is off of Docker's website. So you guys can either pull it from there or pull it from the, my text file in this video description, totally up to y'all. But I'm just going to copy and paste these in here because it's kind of a pain and I don't really feel like typing all this out. Um, so we'll go ahead and paste this guy in and then we'll update everything again. So app get update. There we go. Um, and then we're going to install Docker and a bunch of other stuff. So basically we're going to install Docker, uh, the CLI container D, um, the build plugin and Docker compose plugin. So, and again, this is straight off of Docker's website. All right. So now Docker should finally be installed and we're going to hit enter again. Oops, not there. We're going to do it on this screen, hit enter. And then finally, um, at this point we should be able to, uh, run the Docker hello world command and it should work. So we can't find it locally. It should pull it down and run everything. And there we go. Hello from Docker. This message shows your installation appears to be working correctly. Blah, 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 blah. All right. Next thing we want to do is at this point, Docker is working, but we're going to have to use sudo every time we want to run something associated with Docker. So what we want to do is you want to add uh, or create a group called Docker. Okay, cool. It already exists. Um, and then we want to add ourselves to that group just in case we're not already there. Excellent. And now, um, we should be able to log out and then log back in and, um, should be able to run the same thing. So let's try to run Docker. Hello world, except this time we don't need sudo. And there we go. So, uh, another thing we, we may need to do or want to do, um, is if you're still having issues, you may need to run some of these commands. So, uh, basically make sure that your user owns, uh, the Docker directory and has the, um, permissions to read, write and execute. So, um, and you can run them if you want. It's not going to hurt anything. Um, but I'm, I'm, I'm not, it's not really affecting me. Uh, and then finally we want to, well, this optionally, you can start the service or enable the service to be started, um, when your system starts up. And for me, I definitely want that. I always want Docker to be running and accessible whenever my machine is on. Um, and then I also, we're going to do the same thing for the container D service. So there we go. And let's go ahead and check, um, should be able to say status. Okay. So that's running. And then we should also be able to check the status of the Docker service. Perfect. Okay, cool. So everything should be running. So let's just run a quick Docker PS wonderful Docker images. Okay, cool. So we've got the hello world image. So everything appears to be working correctly. We don't need pseudo. Um, so that's, that's great. All right. Next thing. Now we, we, I want to be able to use GPUs inside of Docker containers. I do this quite often. 
it's extremely important for the way that I like my workflow. Um, and the way to do that is to run this scary command, uh, which is going to get uh, a key ring and set a bunch of other things. And this is all stuff you can find online and then in my in my notes. But basically what this does is it enables you to use NVIDIA Toolkit, uh, or sorry, Container Toolkit. Um, and that basically allows you to use GPUs in, in your container. So there we go, we're gonna install NVIDIA um, Container Toolkit. Okay, we'll restart everything. And then the last thing we need to do is we need to um, go ahead and copy this guy in. So we'll configure Docker as our runtime. And you may not need to do this. I think this is an optional command. Um, just saying basically, hey, um, we want a Docker runtime in our GPUs or something similar to that. Uh, and then we're gonna restart Docker. And then we're gonna check the status of Docker as well. Oop, not stouts, status. All right, great. All right, cool guys. So at this point we should have um, the drivers installed, Docker installed. We should be able to use the our GPUs in our Docker containers. Um, and now just for some more, um, I guess, stuff that, that I use. I like, I mean, I use Git all the time. Highly recommend it. Um, so, you know, need to have that installed. So this is already installed. Another thing that I, I like, you don't have to use, but I use Python and uh, JavaScript primarily these days. So I'm gonna install Miniconda and um, I'm also going to install Node.js. So again, you can find these in the notes or online, but so you need to download um, the shell script. So we'll go ahead and do that. And let's download that in my uh, home directory. And then we need to actually enable it to be executed or enable it so we can execute it. So we'll say chmod plus x, um, that file, the shell script. And then we wanna actually run that shell script. So there we go. And then we'll go through the installation process. So um, please review the license agreement, okay? And then we'll go, sc we'll scroll down, 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 down. And then it asks, do you accept the license terms? Yes, we do. Um, it will be installed in this default location. This is fine for me. Um, you can undo this by running Okay, sorry, uh, basically, do you wanna use this as your default shell? So yes, we do, and this is basically gonna say whenever we, um, so let's exit and let's come back in. Whenever we do that, it's gonna go ahead and start us, or put us in a base environment. Um, so that's, that's all that does. And I find that to be helpful. So okay, we've got Conda installed now. And again, sorry, I just wanted to, didn't introduce this before, but I like mini Conda, it's not as bloated. So that's what I use. But you could also install Conda or whatever you prefer. And you don't even have to do this. You can just use a virtual environments, um, you know, through Vim or one or, or uh, one of the other libraries that handles Python and uh, virtual environments. Or you don't have to use them at all if you don't use Python. So totally up to you. Um, again, I also use Node.js. So we're gonna install that real quick. And you can install this with apt but you get a really old version. So I am gonna go ahead and pull, I am going to pull down a setup uh, shell script from uh, nodesource.com and did that download? Yeah, it did. Um, and then we're gonna run that. So sudo 
um, bash node setup, type in our password. And there we go. Go ahead and install that guy. All right. So now, um, as you can see, to install Node.js, run apt git install Node.js. Why? So we'll go ahead and do that. Okay. I mean, sorry, sudo. There we go. All right, so that seems to have installed, and we'll go ahead and restart the services needed. And there we go. Okay, so let's do node dash version. Okay, so node that is installed, and then npm, I think it's dash v. Yeah, there we go. Um, cool, so node and npm are installed. Let's also do python dash, oh, sorry. Python dash dash version. All right, there we go. So everything's installed, um, or at least those programs, those core programs I need are installed. Um, and then the, the next thing that I'm gonna do uh, is I'm gonna install uh, a GUI. I like KDE Plasma. So we'll do that. Um, and then we'll, I'll install a couple of things like XRDP for remote access, Chrome, VS Code. Um, and then I'm going to restart everything. Uh, and then I'll just show you how that works. And then the last thing I'll do is I'll, I'll, I'll show you the like um, BMC, which is like a remote management for the server. And we'll try to set that up as well. So anyway, point is, if you don't want to watch any of this stuff at this point in the video, um, you're basically ready to use your server in, in you know, whatever way you want, at least with um, in a from a non-GUI uh, perspective. But if you want a GUI, we'll go ahead and set that up now. So, all right, let's go ahead and start, as always, with a sudo apt update dash y. And again, a lot of these are unnecessary, but it's just good practice before you install um, really any programs, it's always good to make sure that you're upgraded or updated, I should say. Um, don't always want to upgrade. Sometimes you can break stuff by doing that. But anyway, so what we're going to do is we're going to install, um, sorry, we're going to install the uh, standard version. So install KD, apt install KDE standard dash Y. And that's going to install um, there's several different flavors. I believe this is, this is like the, the standard version. There's like a full and there's like a light and this is somewhere in the middle. So I, I've used all three and I've found that this has pretty much all the packages and stuff that, um, you know, you, you might want or need without having just needless stuff on there. And then without having to go and find a bunch of things and, and add them. So all right, guys, so that took quite a while, um, but now we're ready to restart the services. All right, excellent. Um, so now KDE Plasma should be installed. The next thing uh, we're going to do is we are going to install XRDP. Um, so sudo apt install XRDP. Um, and this basically is just going to, um, it's going to allow us to remotely access the machine via GUI through remote desktop. And you could use VNC or you could use um, any one of several other, um, several other protocols, but I think RDP is, is pretty good. Um, I think it's most performant. So anyway, it's just what I, what I prefer. So, you know, do whatever you want, follow this if you like. Um, 
but as soon as we get this installed, we're going to go ahead and restart everything. And then we should be able to access the GUI. Um, and we should also be able to, um, access the, our GPUs. So we'll check that out as well. <clears throat> okay. So I just hit enter again to restart the services. Uh, a couple other things we need to do. Um, let's just do sudo service, um, status, or sorry, x rdp status to see where we're at. It is running, so that's good. Um, and then another thing that it recommends to do is add user xrdp ssl cert. There we go. Um, I, I believe this just fixes uh, some, some permission related things. Um, and then finally, we want to sudo service xrdp restart. And then we'll also check the status one more time. Beautiful. Everything's working. Okay, so now we should be able to restart um, our server. And then we should be able to get back into it um, via the GUI this time. That's what we'll try to do through X um, or through RDP. And then we'll finish the rest of the setup from there. We should be able to SSH back into the server. Uh, it should be rebooted by now, hopefully. <laughs> um, so we'll go ahead and check that. Okay, great. So we're able to get back in. So before we go ahead and remote desktop in, and while we're already in it, I'm just gonna go ahead and check that the uh, NVIDIA drivers are working. Yay, wonderful. Okay, so um, these are all working. Right now, I've only got the uh, two P100s in there. Um, Whenever I decided to go a different route with the drives in the server, I had to reorder everything and I needed to do some work um, uh, with some GPUs. So I had to had to shuffle some GPUs around. So I just, I, I moved the P40s into a server so I could, I could run some, um, uh, do some, some modeling with those. But anyway, um, that's why I, I know in the start of this video, we had four GPUs in there. Um, and then that's why we only have two now because I, I, I moved some out between then and now finishing this video. So just wanted to clarify there. Eventually there's going to be six GPUs, but uh, that's really enough about that. Okay, so now let's go and let's remote desktop into this. So we're going to open up remote desktop. Um, and then we're going to type in the IP address of so 10.6. And if we set it up correctly... Um, we should be able to access it. So that's not really a good sign. It should normally be faster than that if everything's working correctly. So, okay. Oh, you know what? I, I know exactly what it is. All right. So this is a good lesson, but, um, we, uh, set up a firewall. So basically, um, sudo ufw status verbose type our password in so yeah see it we only have ssh uh, enabled right now so we need to add uh, some firewall rules to allow us to access it with um, rdp so i'm going to pause this and look up the port number because i've forgotten Okay, so the port number is 3389. Um, so what we're gonna do is we are going to sudo ufw allow uh, port 3389 uh, for TCP, TCP. Uh, and <clears throat> this should allow us in so that we can um, remote desktop. So hopefully this fixes the issue. I'm pretty sure that it will. Um, so let's go back to remote desktop and let's try this one more time. So let's do 
six. There we go. It's at least a better sign. So there we go. So now we need to put our password in. And it's being a little bit slow today. And it's the first time, so it's got to initialize and set some things up. So. Okay, so guys, we're in, finally. Um, so first thing, I guess we'll just enter this password or enter our password. If I am in the correct place, I will enter my password. Okay, cool. So here we are. All right, the next the next couple of things that we want to do, or I, I, I want to do, um, and it's not really anything too crazy is I just, I'm just going to install Chrome, um, so that we can go ahead and use that. So I'll go ahead and open, there we go. Another terminal. All right. So now what we're going to do is we're going to run the command. And again, I have these already laid out, but we're going to copy, we're going to copy and paste in this command that's going to grab us the um, Debian file that we need to go ahead and set uh, this up. And we're going to use um, DPK, DPKG to install it. So we'll go ahead and uh, paste in this command, type in our password, and that's going to go ahead and get everything installed for us. All right, great. Um, one thing you may need to do in, if there's errors is run sudo apt get install dash F or apt install dash F. And that should, um, you know, fix any, um, any errors and issues, but we're going to go ahead, um, and we're going to run it. So let's see here should be able to run, I believe if you type Google dash Chrome, it should run. Okay. So that's not found. Um, so let's go over here and see if we can find Chrome. There we go. Google Chrome. So let's try to activate it that way. Um, Uh, we want to use request create new wallet name kitty wallet. This is used to store sensitive. Um, we're just going to go ahead and use the classic for now. Um, and we'll put our password in. So yeah, we'll go ahead and make that the default browser. Cool. So everything is working. And then we'll go ahead and finish this up. So we'll make this, and you can use whatever password you want here. I'm just going to um, use my standard password. Okay. Um, so I'm not going to sign it at this time, but there we go. So now we have Google. So wonderful. We can now uh, search stuff. What I like to do as well is um, make this a desktop icon. So add to desktop. There we go. I don't know why the, the icon is missing, but either way, you have Google Chrome. Beautiful. So now we can access it there. And then the last thing I'm gonna do um, just in case I'm, you know, I'm working through the GUI, I like to use VS code. So I'm going to install VS code as well. Um, and the easiest way to do that 
is to grab the um, installation file so we'll go to or sorry we'll open up a console and we'll go ahead and we'll install or we'll, we'll pull down this uh, file and we will run we will uh, install this Debian so VS code dot deb we're gonna install that guy oh, sorry that was the wrong password Unmet dependencies. Okay, so we'll do that. Um, so sudo apt uh, fix broken install. Yes. So that should fix um, any broken dependencies. And we'll also, um, since we just installed a massive program, we'll do sudo apt um, up uh, date. So there we go. Apparently, we needed we needed some some updates, and that that can cause problems as well. Whenever you download massive programs, it's always better to run um, apt update and um, apt up grade well at least apt update but sometimes apt upgrade if you want to actually make all of those changes uh, locally um, all right so let's try that one more time and then after a minute we should have vs code installed as well okay um, so it looks like that finished. It gave a strange error, but sometimes it does it, like these things kind of happen. So let's see if, um, we can actually access visual studios code. Okay, great. So everything is working. It seems. So there we go. And I'm also going to create a shortcut for this as well. So right click, add to desktop, and there we go. Ah, and there we go. Finally, we have a nice icon for that guy as well. So anyway, guys, cool. Um, that's pretty much it for this part. Um, we've got, you know, basic things that we might need to use uh, for the GUI. Um, we've got pretty much everything else installed that we, that we might need. Um, you know, like we said earlier, we have, um, we have NVIDIA, we have all of our GPUs working, uh, or they should be anyway. So there we go. They're still all working. Um, so anyway, guys, all this is, all this is good to go. Um, and then the last thing that I'm going to show you guys or try to show you guys how to set up is, um, the like remote management software, which I believe is called like IPMI or BMC. I'm not hundred percent sure which is which maybe BMC works in IPMI or vice versa, but I'll clarify that in the next part, but it's basically like IDRAC for anybody that's used Dell servers. Um, but it's like, it's a remote management, uh, tool to help interact with, uh, the server, um, you know, remotely or, uh, adjust configurations or whatever. So we're going to go and try to get that set up in the next part, if you're interested. All right, guys. So um, back downstairs now, and uh, we're going to go ahead and get into the setup utility. So we're going to hit delete again. So we should be in the setup utility in just a second. Um, and then we're gonna look for IPMI. So here we go. Um, 
I don't know why it didn't occur to me to try to set this up before. I probably should have done this first, actually. So set this up and then from the comfort of my office, set up the rest of the stuff. But you know, live and learn, right? So um, okay, so here, here we go. It says, this is the, the BMC network configuration. So let me just pause and go back here for a sec. So IPMI, uh, since I actually looked all this up while I was like b before I started this video, by the way, but um, IPMI is the Intelligent Platform Management Interface, uh, and BMC is the Baseboard Management Baseboard Management Controller. There we go. Um, basically, the IPMI is the interface with which you uh, interact with the hardware that you access through the actual controller. So basically, BMC is controller hardware. Uh, IPMI is web interface that you use to access it. Is it the best way, an easiest way I can think of to explain it? So let's go back in here. Um, and then I guess we'll say yes. Uh, so let's see. Configuration address source. Yeah, we want that to be DHCP. Um, VLAN. Um, enabled. Yeah, I guess I'll set this as one because all of my uh, management stuff is in VLAN one, at least for my house. Um, although, actually, I, I don't need to do that. This, it, it's gonna be in VLAN one by default, so that's okay. Um, you know, it, it, this may be different for you and how, how your, your uh, home network is set up um, and do I need to fail over um, IPMI land selection? Dedicated, shared, fail over. Okay, so uh, in this case, what it's asking is basically, do you want the your LAN connection or basically your internet, your ethernet connection, I'm saying this badly, do you want IPMI slash BMC to use the same network connection that you use to access the rest of your network on the internet, or do you want it to be on uh, like a separate management port? So for example, if you said dedicated, it would be a different, um, a different like uh, NIC than what your, um, you know, regular internet or, or regular traffic communication port would be. Uh, it would be just for management. Shared would be, it would be over the same um, port as your, you know, like regular internet connection or your basically your, whatever you have normally, it's gonna use that same port. And then failover is gonna start with dedicated. And then if it, th that's not present, it'll use the shared. Um, so in our case, I'm just gonna go with shared because I'm never really planning on putting a failover uh, or sorry, putting a, a dedicated management one in, at least not at this time. So I'm just gonna go with shared. Um, and then again, this is gonna be uh, put in by default, at least uh, whatever VLAN it's in. Uh, and then finally, we're gonna let the, my DHCP server give this uh, a, an IP address. So, all right, cool. So that's all we should really need, guys. Um, and we're gonna go ahead and go and save and exit this. You guys know the drill at this point. Um, so we're gonna go ahead and we're gonna save changes and we're gonna reset. And then I'm gonna go upstairs and we'll find, um, I'll find this particular port, or sorry, the, the MAC address of the BMC and figure out what the IP address is, and then we should be able to access the GUI and um, log in. So that's what we'll try to do. <clears throat> All right, guys, so um, back upstairs, and let's, I've uh, identified the IP address associated with the uh, BMC controller. So we should be able now to access the IPMI uh, interface by going to that IP address. So let's go to 10.7.
and wonderful. We are able to um, access this. So uh, I also, man, I can't speak today. <clears throat> I also looked up the uh, default username and password for IPMI, and it said that it is capital admin and capital admin as well for the password. Let's see if that works. Okay, that did not work. All right, caps lock on. Let's try that. Admin and admin. Okay, so I did not like that. Um, let me go see if I can find another default. All right, guys. So upon quite a bit of research, um, there's a couple of things going on here. One, uh, at a certain point, Supermicro decided that they did no, they did not want to use the default of admin admin anymore, um, and they used admin and then some. Like it's the node uh, service number um, or serial number rather, so. You can find that in this for you server on the side next to rail, supposedly. Um, and then a couple other places like on the motherboard uh, or on the CPU. However, I tried all of that and none of that worked for me. So um, I ended up having to go a different route. So hopefully it works for you. What I would recommend is try admin, admin first. Um, if that works, great. You're good to go. Uh, you can reset the password to whatever you want that doesn't work try admin and looking on your server um, for um, basically uh, where is it here we go this is this is the password guy that they shared so for something that looks like this IPMI and then password so it should look something like that I did not have one of these on my server I don't know if it just got lost or if it got taken off. Um, you can also find them on the motherboard, supposedly. Um, and then on the CPU as well. So I've looked in all these places. I couldn't find it. They also suggest there's a service tag, which isn't present on mine. So anyway, um, yeah, they also suggested look in the back. I, I checked all these places. I couldn't find what they were talking about. So for a second, I thought I was kind of screwed. Um, but then I found this guide from Serve the Home, which was pretty sweet. But basically, you can use this tool called IPMI Config, um, and I use that to add another admin user and then log in via that. So I'll show you guys what I mean here. Um, so the first thing we're gonna do, or we're gonna have to do, is um, log into our server, and I'm gonna use the GUI because we need to actually access this website or access a website and download a uh, piece of software, the IPMI, um, IPMI config. And um, anyway, once we do that, we'll be able to interact with IPMI directly. So, okay, so let's type the password. Hopefully correctly. It's always such a pain. I don't know why they make this so so difficult. Just leave it as admin, admin. Don't change it. I I, I say that. I I know it's for it's for good reason. Um, I know that all companies are uh, more cognizant these days of security. It just sometimes is a pain in the ass as the end user. Um, but anyway, enough of the griping, um, enter this one more time. Wonderful. So what we're going to do is we're going to look up IPMI config. So I'm literally just going to paste it right in Google. Um, and then you can go to Supermicro IPMI utilities. Um, let's see here. Sorry, except we'll go all the way down. Okay, so then we're gonna go download. 
and then we're going to come down here to IPMI, IPMI config, and then I'm going to select um, DOS, Windows, Linux, blah, 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 blah. Um, and then I'm hit download. So it's also, it's going to ask you here if you want to use it, if you want to be a guest or you want to um, you know, sign in. I have an account, so I just signed in to, to download it, but you know, feel free to use guest if you'd rather. So as you can see, I've already downloaded it. Um, and then what I did is uh, I basically took it from downloads. Um, I put it in my home directory and then I opened up. So there, I just moved it there. I opened up console and you don't have to move it to home directory. I'm just probably going to keep it there in case I ever have to, um, you know, use it again for whatever reason. Uh, and I'll clean up some of this stuff later. Uh, basically, so you can see here, it, here it is, this IPMI config. So we're going to CD into this IPMI config or CFG, I should say. Um, and then we're going to CD into the Linux directory. And then we're going to CD into the 64 bit directory. Um, and now this, we can use this executable to run different commands. So we can say backslash IPMI and then help. And that shows us the command options. Um, so supposedly you can use the command FD with option three, um, to set user defaults. So basically set admin back to admin admin. Uh, that didn't work for me. So, and you know, I don't know what the default password is. So restore to factory default and default password. So none of those didn't work for me, unfortunately. Um, so what I had to do is then, um, use the user command. So yes, user, um, and then basically create a new, create a new user. So, uh, if we look, so if we say user list, ah, sorry, let me go back and say sudo user. All right. So as you can see, this was the original admin. Um, so this is the one I don't have the password to. Apparently somebody else had to do this as well. Um, and then now I, I created, uh, another administrator just now that allowed me to log in. So, um, way that you do that, and I'll just create another test. One really quick is you say, uh, oh, you know, let me make this bigger for you guys. So you guys can see, and this is probably a pain in the ass. Okay. All right. So here we go. Um, user. And then the first one is the user ID. So I'm just going to say five. Um, and then I believe it's the username. So we'll say testy, uh, and then we'll call the password. Um, let's call it password. And then the, um, administration administ the pr privilege level. Um, so if we look in this guide, it goes in the last slide and I think it lets us know somewhere in, oh, right here. So administrator level four. So if you want to, you know, whatever, uh, admin level, whatever pr privilege level you want to assign, uh, it's one through four. So let's go back. Uh, where did I, ah, remote desktop. Um, so there we go. We'll assign this as four invalid user ID. Let's see. Maybe I messed up the syntax. Let me see. Let's see. Oh, hold on. Too many screens. Let's see. Syntax user add. Ah, user add. That was it. I was missing add. Okay. So let's take this again. User add. There we go. So now if we go back and we try to list everything, we should see we have another user. So 
testy and it's also an administrator. So if I go back and I go here and I say testy and password, we should be able to log in. So there we go. Um, so now we've finally um, been able to get into uh, the IPMI, which is super useful. Um, personally, the, the thing I like most about it is in addition to, to monitoring um, you know, your system, like for example, uh, let's see, I haven't really taken a full look at all of this stuff. Um, let's see, system, hardware information. There you go. So you can look at all, you can check out all of your hardware, um, like CPU socket, tell you all this information. So anyway, this stuff's pretty useful. Um, it'll also tell you about your server health, have some event logs, power consumption, all of this sensor readings, all this stuff. So that's super useful. You know, that way you don't have to physically be next to your server to tell, you know, if something's going on. Um, but my personal favorite, I use this all the time, is this Lish console. So you can download this. Um, and then if you have Java installed on your machine, um, you can come over here and then you can run. So I've actually already downloaded. I'm just going to use this one. But it's the same difference. Uh, and then open with Java Web Launcher. And continue. And then eventually, okay, I guess authentication. Oh, sorry. So let's try it with this one because this is, this is going to be testy. So let's open with Java Web Launcher. Let's continue. I accept. I want to run. And then boom. You can access your machine as if you were sitting in front of it. And then let's log in. It may not log, log me in because I've already got another user logged in. Or it might just be taking a long time to get everything set up. But, but either way, we don't need this anymore. So I'll go ahead and log out of here there we go so I don't, I'm not, I think it's just frozen up since I'm trying to um, use the console as well okay now it's finally I think it's finally gonna log out now there we go all right cool I just took a long time um, there we go so Now we should be able to log in pretty easily. Now that we're not both trying to access the same user. And there we go. So now it's like you're sitting. In front of the machine and you're able to, you know, interact with it as you would. So I find this useful, um, especially like there's a VPN I have that I have to actually, I can't remote access the machine and then remote with the VPN. So this is useful to enable the VPN so that I can work remotely behind the VPN. So just one example of why you might actually want to use this. Um, but anyway. So guys, I know this has been a horribly long video, uh, and I do apologize for the length of it, but um, you know, I hope that you really got something from this. At this point, all of the major features of your server should be set up. You should be able to uh, you know, pretty much use it as you see fit. And um, 
that's pretty much it. This this server is is primarily designed and built for uh, machine learning, deep learning, uh, in particular, and um, you know the only thing left to, to do now is <laughs> get it set up and throw some GPUs in it and go start tackling some of your projects. So anyway, guys, thanks again. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and uh, end the, the, this video now, and I will uh, see you guys in the next one. All right, guys, brief reminder here. If you enjoyed the content, please consider giving me a like and a subscribe so I can continue to grow and produce better and better content for you. If you really enjoyed the content, you might even consider buying me a coffee and the link for how to do that will be in the video description below. Um, if nothing else, please just give me some feedback and the comments and let me know how I'm doing, uh, if anything's unclear or if there are anything uh, that I can improve on. Thank you again, guys, and have a great rest of your day. Bye-bye.